Perfect. Okay. So uh, we've been. Uh, thank you for. By the way, it's a, it's a great conference. I I really loving it. I learned a lot uh, during this this uh, two days that already. Thank you so much for for this conference. Uh, so we've been hearing about talks on how to use machine learning in a uh, in a physics setting. I want to go a bit beyond that. I want to say how can we use physics for machine learning. So uh, you you heard a lot about the, the Jeff's talk yesterday. So we are we are really good at machine learning. We do we do jet tagging. We differentiate cats and dogs. Everything is perfect. We know how it works. What we don't know is why it works. We have absolutely no clue, and we have no way to good have a, have a good interpretation of it. And it's it's very easy to just just press enter. With, with a pre-compiled Keras uh, framework and just run it and get the results. Perfect, great. What I wanna do, call me a dreamer, I wanna create a fully interpretable network, like as if, as if it's analytic. It's, it's a dream, but this, this talk is basically a pebble, just a pebble towards that direction. So what I wanna talk about is, can we use quantum mechanics to actually have more interpretable network, uh, find a way to use physics to, you know, squeeze out some extra information from this network. And I'm going to talk about tensor networks a lot today. So let's let's go to the outline. So first, I'm going to introduce what is tensor networks. Obviously, I'm going to say tell you how quantum many-body systems work in, in a setting of of machine learning, and then I'm going to give you a hello world of uh, machine learning in high energy physics. Basically, I'm going to do a toy model top tagging and show you that, oh, it actually works. And then we will go beyond and compile this thing in a, in a quantum computer and see how, how it actually scales in a quantum computer. And if we have time, I want to go into this, this learning probability distributions in a, in a quantum device topic. It's, it's a new thing that I figured out. I'm still working on it, but I'm really excited about it. So then, then I will conclude. Okay, let's go through the introduction. So what is, what is a tensor network? Tensor network is basically a, a, a low rank representation of a higher dimensional tensor. So basically a stack of Einstein summation forms, forms a big giant network. It's, a, it's an approximation basically. So for example, in here, I'm showing you an equation. So ABC here shows you basically a simple tensor network, which forms this, this gamma function. So throughout the talk, I'm gonna use this tensor diagram notation, which basically tells you each leg is one rank of this tensor. So each index you see here shows you a, a leg of this, this tensor network. It's basically a stack of Legos. If you, if you wanna you know, remember your childhood and then making, making like, so what do we use this for? This is mainly used in, in uh, representing quantum many body systems. So if I have a if I have a lattice, let's say n dimensional lattice, I can write it in a the, the wave function in this way and then it's basically forms a gigantic uh, tensor. This is great. This each of these legs, the green legs are representing a Hilbert dimensions. Let's say if you have a spin states, each of them are two dimensional Hilbert spaces. So this is great. This is beautiful. The problem is Try to put that in your computer, it will crash. I tried, it crashed every time. So how can we approximate it? So we know that a Hamiltonian in a, in a ground state basically tells you that not every single spin state is entangled completely with each other. So if you have a spin state here, it's not probably entangled from the, with this spin state in the end of the uh, room or wherever. So we can use this information and just basically split each of the states apart using the singular value decomposition or QR decomposition, it's faster, but I wanna emphasize singular value decomposition. So when you, when you do that, you basically create an auxiliary dimension here. I will call this as bond dimension, which is basically a measure of approximation. So this is not exactly the same as this one, this tensor, but it approximate that tensor well enough in a grand state. And it's also uh, it reduces the computational cost. So if I split every single piece and make it like, like a smaller tensors, I can actually fit it in my computer. I can run, I'm happy. 
So perfect. Let's go through what kind of architectures are in there in, in this business. So whenever I show you a tensor network, the green ones, green lines are showing you the Hilbert space dimensions where these are connected to a spin state or whatever have you have in your neural lattice. And the red ones, the red lines are axillary bond dimensions that I created by the destructing this, this tensor structure. So in this business, basically there's matrix product state of one of the most famous uh, architectures shows you an approximation of one dimensional lattice. We can go to two dimensions with projected entangled pair states. There are different, you can, you can capture multiple different entanglement structures in, in a lattice with three tensor networks. And there's multi, and now that I can't pronounce this, multi-scale entanglement renormalization ansatz if you want to embed uh, some sorts of symmetries, uh, rotations in your qubits, etc. So today I'm going to mostly talk about matrix product state, but feel free to ask me why on earth I'm not using this, because I'm going to show you examples on hadronic color meter image classification. This is two-dimensional example, so why on earth am I using matrix product state? So you feel free to ask me why am I not using it? It, it is possible to use, but why the case in this particular case, why I'm not using this? Please feel free to ask. So let's let's talk about how actually represent the data in a, in a spin state, right? So the thing is how to embed this data, how can I form a network to have a machine learning application and how to train this network? So as a matter of fact, data embedding. So I have a real data, right? Let's say PT coming from the detector or whatever you have in your data. This is a real single parameter. If you have a N dimensional feature space, every single one is a real thing. So what I need is I need a mapping function to map this real vector into a complex space with M dimensional uh, Hilbert space, let's say. So if I did that, I will basically create a superposition of, of states, orthonormal states, and I can create a, create a vector product of, of my data. So each of these are basically a stack of vectors. So now my data is not just a single value, it's a, it's a vector, okay? This, 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 is just, this is not a batch, this is just a single data feature space that I have. So I have PT, eta, whatever, each of them are mapped into a vector. So how about the network? So I showed you this wave function earlier. Basically, I need an output, right? I need a log its of, of my design. So this needs to tell me if it's zero or if it's one, if I'm doing a classification, for example. So this purple line shows you, I can put it anywhere in the mate tensor. It doesn't make any difference. Actually, my algorithm has another feature that it can move along during the training. I'm not going to go into that, but this is basically gives you the log. So what I'm going to do is each of these tensors in the bottom line here, blue ones are trainable parameters. And the upper portion is basically my feature space that represents a spin state, each of them. So if I contract this, this is basically gives me the output of the network, right? The, the, the contraction of this, this two tensors gives me the output. Great, perfect. The beautiful thing is this is a wave function, right? So if I take the mod square of it, this is gonna give me a probability distribution. Perfect, that's what I'm looking for because I need to tell this is a cat or this is a dog, whatever am I looking for. And tensor networks has intrinsic uh, property that it has, topological nonlinearity. It's not uh, analytically nonlinear. It is topologically intrinsically nonlinear when you, when you play with it. So it can capture the nonlinearity of your data without having actually this activation functions. And I will show you in a minute how it's actually possible. So the thing is actually Marat had a, last time, last time I talk, give this talk, Marat had a really nice point saying that, oh, he's not here, right? Oh. He left, bummer. So he said that uh, this is actually very similar to kernel models, right? If you, if you think about it, it's basically stack of uh, linear kernel models. Yes, in, in a sense, 
Uh, the thing is, yes, there's, the kernel models are known to be used in uh, quantum simulations. Try to we can we can represent quantum systems with kernel models. Actually, uh, I think I'm pronouncing your name wrong, but you, Eliska, showed us yesterday. If you go further, even uh, Boltzmann machine can represent a quantum simulation, but she showed us that if we add a little bit more physics in it, it gives much more information. Uh, and 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 gives much good results. So, my question is: Can we use this? Can we embed this little information, uh, physics intuition, into our machine learning application? So, yes, it's a little bit uh, kernel metal method likes as as Marat pointed out, but the difference between kernel methods and and tensor networks are basically so. This is can be categorized as nonlinear uh, kernel methods. Yes, perfectly. The main difference is tensor network scales linearly when you extend your, your feature space compared to the kernel methods because kernel methods require larger and larger matrix to represent the same states. The most important thing that I love about tensor networks is it is more interpretable. And that's what I'm looking for. Kernel method is a generic machinery that you plug and play, press enter, and it will optimize eventually. If you have a good big model, it will, of course, you can give a gigantic net neural network to your quantum system, and it will give you an optimized thing, optimized results. It will give you a ground state, but what does it actually mean? And the thing is, optimization algorithm is adaptive. So what do I mean by that? As tensor networks are not trained by uh, generally in, in quantum simulation case. They are not trained by uh, stochastic gradient descent. They are trained by something called density matrix randomization group algorithm. What it does, I'm not gonna show you detail, but feel free to ask. I have backup slides to show you how exactly this works in, in a machine learning perspective. What it does is it's basically creating a dynamic sponge-like network during your training your uh, network expands the, the, the uh, auxiliary dimensions and basically adapts to the complexity of your problem. Even if you initially didn't say, okay, I don't care about the entanglement. Let's say I'd, I'm not gonna use any entanglement in this system. Your network intrinsically gradually gr grows and learns the complexity of the system. So that's, that's the beauty about it. So I'm just gonna use classical uh, minimization techniques where I'm gonna use the, the cross entropy function for the, for the loss. So it's pretty standard. I get the loss, I get the derivatives. I basically cal calculate the, the, the optimization, minimize this, this trainable parameters, the blue tensors, and try to see if, if it actually gives me anything. So let's go to top tagging. Uh, why, why am I actually using top tagging? Because we know a lot about top tagging. There are a lot of uh, analytic tools to, to learn how to, how to differentiate top from QCD. We know that when the top quark is boosted in an in, in LHC experiment, they can be collected in a fat jet. And you can basically see the tree prong structure when the uh, image is standardized. This is, I think, 5,000 uh, events in mean of 5,000 events in this image. So we know how it works. And there's ton of tons of tons of machine learning applications that actually does the classification. Perfect. So how can we go beyond? Oh, we were talking about you. You missed it. <laughs> so how can we go beyond, actually? So uh, yeah, first of all, of course, why do I think that tensor networks may be, may be good for this particular application or any kind of application really? So I thought, as I told you, tensor networks are really good at uh, representing a ground state where your, part, your, your spin states are not completely entangled, but far, if they are far from each other, but if they are close to each other, you can get the local entanglement. So this is great. So jets are basically the same thing. If you if you see these islands in a, in a prong structure, you basically catch this this. I'm claiming that this tensor network will be able to catch this localized small jets, and it will be able to identify and differentiate QCD jets from the from the top quark. So yeah, this is what we are trying to do. So 
let's go and talk about my standardization techniques. I'm not doing any magic here. This is basically everybody uses this standardization techniques. I'm not going to go into detail. Basically, I'm just taking a fat jet, rotating the uh, inner substructure, putting it center and uh, standardize my image. One extra thing that I'm doing, this is a gigantic tensor network. So I'm just going to make my life simpler. I'm just going to get the 10 by 10 image by not losing too much information. And I'm going to try to uh, classify this basically. So the thing is how I'm going to put this into, into my, my network, because this is, as I said, this is an image. It's not a one dimensional lattice. So I'm basically going to go, uh, an S-shaped reshaping algorithm, let's say, and I'm going to make this as a lot as the thing that I'm trying to do is I'm trying to put these uh, points as close to each other as possible. So, so that the 10th uh, pixel is as close as possible to the first one, because, you know, uh, when I put them apart from each other, they are clearly entangled to each other. When I put them apart, uh, I won't be able to capture it. So I'm trying to put them as close as possible. And I I'm feeling a bit cheeky. So instead of representing this as a spin state, like to, to uh, dimensional vector space, uh, Hilbert space, I'm mapping it to a 10 dimensional hypersphere. Okay, so it's a, it's a gigantic vector for each of these pixels in here. I, I have another, point, hey, sorry. I guess at this point is where one should ask the question why if, why you're using, uh, you're not using the two dimensional. Lattice. Yes, because, I will. Because I will. So I will come now to that. You, okay, because now you are you're you're, you're sort of uh, yes. These connections uh, define uh -huh. some, need, exactly. some some notion exactly. of distance. So how do you? Okay, you will tell exactly. Me. Ask me after the talk. Okay, okay. Because no, no, it's no, it's no, a bit it's a bit no no no. It's a bit a long explanation. No, but so then uh, like, in this uh, so snake type of yes. thing, how do you then re remember that? Uh, I mean, how do you? Yeah, remember that P one P T one is close to P T nine. So let's say this. Uh, so the structure that uh, so provides it's, connection only to, to yeah. Okay. So it's it's basically captured by the bond dimension. If I have large enough bond dimension between each tensors, I will be able to capture longer distances. But if I compress this, if I have a lower bond dimension, I won't be able to. Yes, I won't be able to capture this entanglement between these two. But two dimensional case, please do. I will forget. Please do ask me, and I will I will explain why it didn't work. There are papers, by the way, uh, doing classification with the 2D version. I will explain why in this particular case it didn't work. So I want to put one more on my on my network. I will say that they are not correlated. None of the pixels are correlated with each other in the beginning of my training sequence. So I'm going to let Tensor Network to learn the correlation, build up the uh, network, and say, say, come, give me a, give me a result. So perfect. So I'm going to limit a little bit the, the bond dimension. I'm just going to let them to gradually increase up to 20 bond dimensions, because otherwise it will go to infinity and crash my computer, which I don't want. So 20 is very, very conservative number. Generally in quantum simulations, they are using 10 to the power of three bond dimension maximum. Well, they go to more, but yeah, I'm, I'm being conservative, very conservative. So in here, I'm basically showing you the classification output where the red one is showing you the uh, signal and the, uh, the, the, the blue ones are background and the dashed lines are convolutional neural network. As you can see, they are really, really close to each other. And in the rock curve case, uh, if we go to the, to the this, oops, sorry. If you go this direction, it gets better. So as you can see in the rock curve, MPS is blue and uh, my green is convolutional neural network. So I'm getting the exact same result almost, but this is not the interesting part, okay? Of, obviously, if I'm giving this talk here, you were expecting something along these lines. So the interesting thing is, can you, yes, thank you. How can we interpret this? What? Why on earth am I using this tensor network? Because it's obviously, oh God, really? Uh, so uh, why on earth I'm using this tensor network? Uh, and how can we go beyond? So what I'm going to do is this is a wave function, right? So I can calculate the entanglement entropy between each sites. So what I, when I do that, I basically get this mapping without the data, by the way, just the network. 
you can see that the, the entanglement entropy information changes at the center mainly. So what I'm gonna say is, can I use this information? It's, it has this bin structure. So if I take this into each bin and I just take this maximum entanglement entropy in, within that bin, can I, can I reproduce the same result? I'm basically gonna throw out pixels and just form the network again. So what I got, did is the red curve here shows you when I throw out everything, I reduce to 54 pixels and then I'm, I'm trying to, so I'm gonna say, okay, let's train this 50 more epochs and let's see what are we gonna get. Actually tensor network learned to get more or less the same results with less trainable parameters and less pixels. So I don't need half, almost half of my network and almost half of my uh, pixels at all. So why this is important? Actually, if you compare this to stochastic gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent actually does not capture this. So in the, in the case of the MRG algorithm, we can, we can suppress this weird fluctuations. And what I'm trying to write, do right now, can we actually use this for uh, pilot mitigation? Because I have really good results right now. I'm, it's not finalized, but I see that it might be possible to suppress the pilot with this kind of uh, training algorithm. There are other studies using the same thing. They are using this in three tensor network structure, which is a great study. I'm not going to go into that. So let's go directly to the quantum machine learning case. So as we, as you heard about how quantum machine learning works, you basically have trainable parameters, gates, you embed your data in it and try to optimize your system. So what I want to do is, can we do this? Can we map this tensor networks into a, a quantum circuit because they are basically representing a quantum state. As a matter of fact, if you have a, a cyclic graph tensor network, uh, you can directly transpose this, this uh, gate into a quantum circuit, but I'm not going to use exact representation. I'm just going to get a simple representation as possible with the circuit and then try to get, see compared with classical and the quantum tensor networks. So what I'm going to do is basically I have these gates. Gates are taking only two input and gives you two output. As I said, I have only a simplistic case. I have two gates and I have just y-axis rotation. So each of these gates having just one trainable parameter. So I'm basically going to calculate the wave function, uh, sorry, expectation value, probability distribution, same old story as before. I'm just going to optimize this, this value with this spin state. So with four qubit, I didn't see much difference. There's no, no problem. I'm not going to show you that result, but I'm going to show you the six qubit case. What I see is I'm just basically forming the quantum version of the circ, uh, of the tensor network uh, and just training them and try to match the tensor network, classical network to the quantum state, sorry, quantum result. So what I see is interesting. I get the same result with six qubit, but as you can see here, so the dashed lines are the, are the classical version. The number of parameters that I need for the classical to match the quantum is just amazing. It's too hard. So I need so much parameters, too, so much Hilbert space dimensions, Hilbert space mapping and a bond dimension to match the quantum state. Quantum has only how many? Nine, nine here, nine trainable parameters, nine here and 17 here. It's amazing. So it's actually what we observe is basically just increasing the bond dimension is not enough to match the result of the, of the quantum state. And also what we observe is using uh, Fisher information and effective dimension, we observe that actually loss landscape for the classical network is basically getting flat and flat with, with uh, more bond dimensions and more um, Hilbert space mapping. I'm not gonna show you, but in the paper, we have the result if you are interested. So I wanna really quickly talk about how to learn the probability distribution with quantum uh, probabilistic hybrid learning. So this is, I'm trying to get a quantum version of normalizing flows. So it's quantum circuits are basically, you have a unitary gate, you measure the output and you optimize the, your unitary gate. What if I can put the density matrix of the data in my circuit? What if can represent the density matrix of my data in here? So how can I do that? I can basically say, take the sigmoid of my uh, data, sample it, and if I 
in here without any trainable parameters whatsoever. If I just measure the Pauli Z matrix probability in each one, it will approximate the sigmoid of your data, which is great, which is what I'm looking for. So I'm basically embedding the density matrix of my system in my network. So what also I want to get is, okay, I can use uh, Ising Hamiltonians if I'm uh, using, using like an image system, but what I want to use is actually, can I create a Hamiltonian that can train this, that, that can optimize with the network? So I'm going to use uh, Boltzmann machines. Details are already talked about in, in yesterday. So you can go ahead and, and check those, those talks. So I'm gonna use the Boltzmann machine to create a Hamiltonian and optimize it with, with the, optimize this the Hamiltonian. So my loss function is, oh yeah, basically by, when I'm do that, I'm basically creating a density matrix in here and I'm trying to make this as close as possible to Sigma D. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna optimize the KL divergence, quantum version of the KL divergence, basically expectation value of this K and log Z, the partition function. So basically this is try, when it's approximated, it basically gives me the entanglement entropy of my data. So for free of charge. So what I try to do is I basically take the same example before, I take two, four, four qubits, and I try to calculate this, this matrix. And I, what I get is, as you would expect, my fidelity with respect to this, this initial density matrix and the final density matrix is basically increasing with, with the more uh, Monte Carlo examples that I have, which I'm expecting this. This is a very preliminary result, by the way. Uh, and my KL divergence between each of these density matrices is also decreasing with if I have more Monte Carlo examples. Thank you very much. So this is what I'm expecting. And this is basically giving me free of charge the uh, entanglement entropy of my system. So what I want to actually extract this in the future, uh, hopefully soon, uh, what does this Hamiltonian mean in my system? That's what I want to learn. Can I use this to discover some underlying physics or can I use this for something beyond or what what is this used for if you have any ideas I'm, I'm really interested in that so let's go to the conclusion so I talked about tensor networks how can we use tensor networks how can we use quantum many body systems to represent a machine learning problem it is very very amazing tool to use because it has immense amount of theory built behind it so we can use it we can we can put all our physics information into this network and train it and optimize it. And we have interpretable kind of as, as much as possible network that we have compared to uh, regular neural networks that we use. So we have amazing theory, amazing understanding and just tensor network community is just so wide and they have all these optimization tools already there. We don't need to create new things. We can just take it from there and use it. So in the quantum case, I showed you the representability of the quantum versus the classical is amazing. So we can represent the same thing with much less parameters. Yes, it will also be faster as you heard about it, but I'm not that interested in the faster part. I'm, I'm a theoretical physicist. I'm interested in the representability and the, and the uh, interpretability of my network. But of course, there's a lot of limitations in the quantum circuits. I cannot go beyond, I don't know, 30 qubits right now, the simulation. Uh, IBM doesn't allow me to go beyond seven qubits. So it's really, really restricted, but there's a lot of potential. And yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for this very nice talk. Questions from the audience? Hi, thank you for the nice talk. My pleasure. Could you explain a bit more the last embedding you do on the data to learn the probability density? Yeah. I'm not sure I follow. Okay, sure. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, I skipped so fast, I didn't have much time. That's, that's, uh, where is it? Okay, so what I do is I basically, so my data is, I don't know, PT, let's say, okay? PT set of PTs. So I take the sigmoid of this function it's like uh, in, in normalizing flow, you need to represent the, the, the probability distribution. So I take the sigmoid, put it in a Bernoulli distribution, just sample it from there. 
And if, if I take like, like thousands of sample from there and take the mean, it will give me the basically when I, when I embed this in here, the, the mean of the, the diagonal terms of my density matrix after embedding this into here will give me basically the, the probability of each pure state. That's what I'm doing and taking by basically the uh, Pauli Z matrix information here. So that basically approximating the sigmoid of the data, what I initially give. Thank you. Sorry? CI. Which one? The brown is missing there. Oh, yeah, you're Otherwise right. Otherwise, wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're also right. before, there was the two density markers that you have said. In the previous slide, no, it was before. Uh, I remember the number of the slide, but uh, it's entirely before, possible. Before, yes. Uh, here, this one? Here, yeah. Of course, that one is wrong unless the state is a product state. Sorry, which one yeah, is the it? one on the top right side? Yeah, the core. Yeah, this is right. Yes. This is a product state. You are exactly so if it is right. no entanglement, yeah, yeah. you are looking for yeah, entanglement. Yeah. You're exactly state. right. Yes, 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 definitely. Thank you. Thank you. I should change it. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question because I'm, uh, I mean, I, I have lots of questions. I would ask later. Please but, go ahead. Uh, the, uh, each node, right, in a tensor network, like how many parameters does it have? Does it have, like when, when you... I don't have the exact number, but... No, I mean, when you, when you schematize, for example, uh, like uh, maybe at the very first, at the very beginning of the talk, like you, 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 you the example where you have the uh, an embedding with phi, and then you connect, and this is like a basic tensor network, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But the the single node, the, the training node, mm -hmm. like the, the the parameter that you train, mm -hmm. how many in, in, when you use TensorFlow, how many okay. variables are so inside it? Basically? Imagine I have this is the out. Oh, this is horrible. This is the data, right? Yeah. And okay. this is my tensor network. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Initially, yeah. initially, I said that uh, the the bond dimensions are one. So this is one, this is one, okay. and this is I said I mapped this to a ten dimensional Hilbert space, so ten. Okay. So the there's in one tensor there's ten so, trainable like, parameters. For, for first thing, if without the bond between them, it would be a linear regression, right? Am I getting it yes. right? Okay. Basically, okay. you're multiplying this. Okay. So just... if you if you add the bond, then mm -hmm. you multiply everything. Exactly. Okay. But that's why it's mm -hmm. no linear intrinsically. Basically. Yeah. The, okay. Yeah. Okay. So each node, it's ten. Mm -hmm. So then, then uh, my algorithm increases these values. So okay. let's say it increases up to twenty. Of course, there's a canonical structure of the tensor network because of this situation. So if you don't have periodic boundary conditions, yeah, okay, it okay. will be like like uh, two, four, eight. I may be missing something. So, so it, in the center, it will be maximum, and on the edges, it will basically okay. die out. So each node here, it's like ten times. 20, 20, 20 okay. in the maximum case. So 10 times 20 one times plus 20. one. Am I getting it, right? No, no, this is a tensor, right? So it's like, like a matrix, 10 times one times one. So in case of if I have 20 bond dimensions, 10 times 20 times 20, oh. plus all the other ones. Okay, okay. So each node is like a huge number of exactly. parameters. Exactly. Okay, okay, thank you. My pleasure. Okay, so any more questions? I promised you the peps. You all the, uh, the an answer. Do you have? Do we have time? Uh, I think it's better if we move to to lunch. Uh, we can discuss huh? a lot. Uh, uh, <laughs>